to go ahead and continue where we left off last time talking about uh, the non-human primates. What can we learn from them to gain insight into the human condition? Um, so sort of continuing this idea of culture, where does it come from? The non-human primates. And so you've seen this before. This is just to refresh us, uh, recall where we left off. We have this diagram to help us think about where does culture reside? Um, if we can't define it as everything, so what exactly is it? And so far, we've talked about it being learned primarily, acquired through this process of social learning, the group that you're born into. Um, Tyler, he kind of talks about the universal nature of culture. We all have it. Um, but in the Lowy sense, we all have different ones. There's a lot of diversity. Um, is there any biological influences on culture? Um, do any other animals have culture? And so this is sort of what we left off talking about. Jane Goodall, famous primatologist, studied chimpanzees for several decades. And she was basically the first to observe chimps not only using tools, but making tools, modifying an object to better suit um, their end goal, whatever that might be. There's lots of different examples. Prior to this, humans were defined by the fact that man, the tool maker, um, so that when she observed chimps using tools, we, it was said either we have to redefine tool, redefine man, or consider chimps humans. After that, humans were defined by having culture, right? We have culture, other animals don't. That's also not true as science has progressed. Chimps are our closest biological living relative to humans. We share about 98% of our DNA with them. Um, and so it, what can we learn from them, from their evolution, their anatomy, their social behavior to hopefully gain insight into humans? Where do we come from? Washoe, that was the very first chimp that they told, taught sign language to. Washoe had an adopted son, Lolis, um, that sort of she became the mother of this baby chimp. And so the humans did not sign in front of Lolis. They just made sure that that Lolis never saw them signing with Washoe. And one day, uh, he, the caretakers came around, the researchers came around the corner and saw Lolis signing with Washoe. Um, so it was really cool because, the, again, humans had never signed in front of Lolis. It was Washoe uh, that taught her adopted son how to use sign language, right? This is learned behavior. This is culture passed down generationally. Um, one other sort of example on the slide, Washoe, again, named after Washoe County, in Nevada, um, for the very first one they taught ASL to, um, her, the, the human that sort of took care of her, her baby had died. Um, and when Washoe found that out, she signed cry, right? So very intelligent, very sentient being. So Jane Goodall would say chimps absolutely have culture. It was in the 1960s that she first witnessed this tool making I was referencing. Um, chimps were fishing termites out of a mound they were using sticks to do it. Uh, you'll see an example in a minute, actually, a video clip. Um, but also modifying that stick, pulling branches and leaves off to make it more suitable to their goal, right? Pulling the termites out. This is object modification. This is tool making. And it's not just termite fishing. Um, at Gombe alone, sort of Jane Goodall's main study site, objects are used in nine, ten different ways for different purposes. Um, anything from getting food, like cracking open nuts or um, sociality, sex, um, drumming on trees to communicate, aimed missiles for hunting. We're going to see several examples here as we go today. Other parts of Africa, um, other populations of chimps have different unique tool using behaviors that, that are different from those that we see at Gombe. And in each case, what we see among these populations, these behaviors are passed down. They're not they're not born with them, they're learned, passed down through observation, demonstration, and practice through culture. Um, here's just a pic picture of chimps learning to use tools. And then look at the, the infants and the juveniles sort of watching, watching the adults. Um, just like humans, chimps have a very long period of maturation so that for it requires years of social learning and development before individuals are ready to go out on their own. Um, just like human children, right? Babies, if you, if you don't do anything for them, you don't take care of them, they'll die, right? They need lots of interaction and help and care um, to learn how to survive in their environment. Same for chimps. 
Um, and tool use varies from individual to family, to the community, and even between different populations. Um, quick question, how do we know that these behaviors are cultural rather than biological, rather than written in the genes of the chimpanzees? How would we know that, that it's cultural, that it's learned rather than biological? If it was biological, then we would expect the behavior to be universal across the species, but that's not what we find. If you go to different parts of Africa, different chimp populations, and even within a population, you see different types of cultural behaviors because it's cultural. Let's watch um, a couple of examples. Lots of different types of behaviors depending on where, um, what population that you go to. And so culture um, defined behaviors passed down from one generation to the next through observation, demonstration, and practice, right? And it's not, it's not just the apes. It's not just um, sort of the higher prime, non-human primates that demonstrate these behaviors. Um, it's monkeys, too. Uh, macaques, for example, one of the more diverse of the primates, they have been known in Indonesia. There's different macaques in different places. Um, humans, when they were starting to do research there, they used to provision the macaques. They'd throw yams out on the beach to get the macaques to come out so they could observe them. And then one day after they've been doing this for several days, um, one of the females in the group took the yams um, out of the sand and then went over and washed them off, started washing them off in the water because same, same for us, right? If you drop something in the sand and then go take a bite of it, it's not so great. Um, and so they started washing the sand off, took just a couple of days, the whole population, the whole group um, was then doing that. Not only eating the yams, but going and washing them off. There's another type of macaque that the sort of northernmost primate aside from humans, um, Japanese macaques that live in really cold temperatures, snow, and dur during these times they'll go hot tubbing, basically. There's natural hot springs in that region, and but not just anyone can get in the hot tub. There's a, so a very rigid social hierarchy, and only high status individuals can actually get in the hot springs. Others are excluded. Uh, there's actually some video of that we're not going to watch. It's kind of sad. It's almost sad. Um, so highly intelligent, highly complex social organizations. Um, one of the crucial insights from Jane Goodall's research and the, the work that's happened since is the difference between human animals and other animals is a little blurrier, a little fuzzier than we initially postulated, right? It's, it's we draw these um, sharp, distinct boundaries between our species and others but really we're on a continuum, on a spectrum, separated sort of by these gradients. Um, the picture, it's a, a chimp maybe grooming probably, um, picking, I don't know if Jane Goodall has bugs in her hair, but it's a social behavior, it's a bonding behavior. Um, you'll see fa families and, uh, and friends, if you will, sort of do that with each other among the chimps. Right? We, we do each other's hair too sometimes. So the debate rages on um, about the usefulness of studying primate behavior to deepen our understanding of human behavior. Um, because the non-human primates aren't human, so some would argue, you know, what can you really learn or extrapolate from that? Um, from an evolutionary perspective, again, they are our closest biological relative. Um, we're, we have connections in our evolutionary past once shared a common ancestor. So others would argue um, that there are things to be learned. Um, let's look at an example. What can we learn? Uh, the example I have for you is of chimpanzee aggression. Um, so this example comes from research at Gombe, and it was before aggression in chimps had been observed. No one had really seen this side of them yet. In 1971, one of our researchers, David Bigot, observed a brutal attack on a female of a neighboring community. She was set upon, it's British, 
by a group of our males who hit her and stamped on her British um, one after the other. During the course of the assault, which lasted more than five minutes, her infant of about 18 months was seized, killed, and partially eaten. The mother managed to escape, but was bleeding heavily, badly wounded. She probably died later on. And it was, it was shocking. No one had seen this yet. All that people had really seen was some of the cute stuff that I just showed you. Um, let's watch a clip of this, of chimpanzee aggression territoriality. Um, and so th these observations, this research into chimpanzee aggression was used to argue that humans are inherently aggressive, inherently violent. Um, I'll come back to that. But there's another type of uh, chimp that humans are just as closely related to as we are the common chimp, and that's bonobos. Um, pan paniscus. So remember our scientific naming, our binomial nomenclature. You don't need to know what that is, um, but we use the genus and then the species to designate uh, the species we're talking about. So Homo sapiens, um, pan for chimps, pan troglodytes is the common chimp, pan paniscus is bonobos. And so normally I'll just say chimps or bonobos, um, but they're both types of chimps. Promise not to test you on that. And they're also known as the make love, not war ape because their behavior, their social behavior is almost opposite what we just saw among the common chimps. Research on bonobos occurred after the 1970s research on pan troglodytes that we just took a look at an example of, even the example is a little more recent. Um, there's a great book if you're interested in bonobos, and if you're interested in any of this, sort of the biological roots of humans, our evolution, why we became bipedal, why we can do this, and how that's adaptive, um, take a biological anthropology course or even an evolution course. It's a good book by Franz de Waal talking about bonobos, and in it, he essentially argues that um, because of his observations and what he's seen in bonobos, and their compassion and th that really permeates their society um, that humans are simply different types of apes, that we actually aren't all that different. This is what Franz de Waal says. Um, so ju I just want to quote from what he says. Uh, In conclusion, the non-human great apes and humans are simply different types of apes that, and that empathetic and cooperative tendencies are continuous between these species. Um, the following quote sort of illustrates this. We start out postulating sharp boundaries, such as between humans and apes, or between apes and monkeys, but are in fact dealing with sandcastles that lose much of their structure when the sea of knowledge washes over them. They turn into hills leveled evermore until we are back to where evolutionary theory always leads us, a gently sloping beach, right? We're all sort of part of this spectrum. Um, this continuity. A little bit more about bonobos. They're the rarest of all the great apes. So the great apes, your orangutans, gorillas, and chimpanzees, including bonobos. Um, Gibbons and siamangs are the, the lesser apes. That San Diego Zoo has them, the ones with really, really long arms. They brachiate and swing through the trees and they sing, they duet. Anyways, uh, bioamp class. They're the rarest of all the great apes. They're highly endangered. Um, and they're just as closely related to us as common chimps. Uh, we think that bonobos and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor sometime around two to three million years ago before they began to genetically diverge and ultimately speciate into different species. So bonobos live in the Congo in Central Africa. You can see that here on the map, sort of where in Africa and then a close up. Um, small population and, and we know the least about them compared to the other great apes. Scientists think that what led to their divergence from the common chimp, um, so they once shared a common ancestor, the Congo River formed sometime around two million years ago, separating this ancestral chimp population Ge geographically separating the population, splitting it into two. 
Um, over time, because chimps are, are not proficient swimmers, the two populations remained geographically isolated, thus reproductively isolated, not able to interbreed, leading to genetic divergence over time, um, speciation over very long periods of time. And I think uh, chimps live, I wanna say north of the river, um, bonobos south. Yes, okay, just make sure I get that. I, I'm not gonna ask you that, but. And bonobo behavior is quite different than uh, chimpanzees. Very little violence, um, almost none. And in contrast, instead of violence or aggression or territoriality, um, compassion and lots and lots of sex is what permeate, permeates their society. Um, it's, it's sort of their social lubricant and not even, not even no pun intended there. Um, they do it when they come upon a new feeding ground, when they meet each other after they have a fight, um, just because whatever, it's been an hour, so let's do it again, um, all over the place. So sex is really, really key to their social life. It basically relieves tensions. That's what I mean when I say it's sort of the social lubricant. Um, again, they're this make love, not war ape. So just some interesting facts about bonobos. Uh, studies indicate Females have higher social status. It's a female dominated society. Aggressive encounters between males and females are rare. Males are tolerant of infants and juveniles. Males get their status from their mother. Social hierarchies exist, um, but they don't play as much of a prominent role. Ranks not as important as it is in other primate societies. Um, because of because they're so promiscuous, they're sort of mating. And it's not just male, female, it's female, female, male, male. Um, the only sort of relationship that sexual relationship that doesn't happen is sort of between um, parent, parents and their children, right? Son and their adult mother. <clears throat> because there's so much promiscuity, the, the fathers don't often know which offspring are theirs. And so usually most of the care for infants falls on the mother. Um, but the males are in general, um, they're not aggressive towards infants or anything like that. They play with them. Um, sexual activity generally plays a major role, uh, being used as what some scientists perceive as a greeting. They use it as a means of forming social bonds, a means of conflict resolution and post-conflict reconciliation, sort of make up sex, right? Bonobos are the only animal to have been observed engaging in all of the following activities, face-to-face -face genital sex, um, although a pair of Western gorillas apparently was photographed doing that, uh, tongue kissing, because that's what we call it, and oral sex. So again, permeates their society. Also, bonobos don't form permanent monogamous bonds with each other, which it would make sense, right? Because you're, you're not monogamous, right? You're sort of mating all over the place. <clears throat> okay, we have one more clip for you today. It's probably my favorite. It's only about four, four and a half minutes. Um, it's called Things You Probably Didn't Know About Bonobos. And that's the last clip we'll watch for today. Um, so bonobos, really so cute. I love bonobos, um, so I'm biased on that. A lot of researchers saw that initial chimpanzee, the pantroglyditis research. Oh, chimps are aggressive. This is sort of the non-human primates. They generalized, um, incorrectly mm -hmm. so, because bonobos who are just as closely related to us exhibit the total opposite type of behavior. Um, so let's compare chimps, male dominated, and competitive, can be aggressive, territorial, um, defend their resources, defend their mates. Bonobos, in contrast, female dominated. Um, the status of an individual depends on the status of the mother. That's what gives you your rank in society. And whether a species is female dominated or sort of male dominated in their social behavior, a lot of that depends on how that species has adapted to their environment. Right. Um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not like a choice that the biological population makes. It's all interrelated to how they're surviving and reproducing in their particular habitat. So a lot of the social behavior we see, whether it's patriarchal, matriarchal, that's actually adaptations 
to the environments in which these species um, live. Um, bonobos, female dominated. Nearly vegetarian. Um, and if you're eating plants rather than meat or maybe fruit or nuts, which are a little scarcer compared to leaves, you tend to be less territorial um, because your resources are all over the place. You don't really have to defend them in the same way you might if you're protecting a fruiting tree. They're less competitive. And rather than aggression, violence, sex and compassion is what permeates their social groups. Um, again, the status of the males depends on the mother's status. Very, very different, almost opposite, if you will, from the common chimp. And so two studies about chimp aggression were used to argue humans are inherently aggressive. The more recent bonobo research calls these assumptions, which is exact, these are assumptions. That's not scientifically based. That's a, that's a guess. That's in someone's idea. Um, the bonobo research really calls these assumptions into question about humans being naturally or biologically aggressive. <laughs> the, the key point, human society, homo sapiens are the most diverse among all the, not, the primates, right? We are primates. We can be aggressive and or compassionate. It is not predetermined and written in our genes to be violent or not. So much of the way you end up violent, aggressive, um, or sort of compassionate has to do with the society, the culture that you grow up in, what you are taught to think, believe, and do. <clears throat> I hear arguments a lot still about the inherent aggressiveness of humans, that oh, just how humans are as a species. And I don't buy into it. I find it to be complete bullshit, um, not only because from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, there's no real basis for that argument, right? Sort of bonobos versus chimps were equally related to both. <clears throat> but if you look at human society through space and time, the examples are endless of groups that are not violent, not aggressive, that, um, that share, that value equality and the group over individuals. You know, valuing the individual and individual success and sort of the rugged individualism of America that we all learn in our US history, history textbooks, <clears throat> that's, that's bizarre to a lot of people living around the world right? That where the value in other societies is, is the group. It's not valued when one person's belly is full and other people are going hungry. That is stigmatized. That is looked down upon in other societies like the Kung, which we'll start talking about. Here. Your book kind of addresses this too. I think they talk about the Yanomamo. We'll talk about them later in the class. Tend to be more aggressive, a lot of violence in their society. Um, one of the other the examples I think they give is the Samai in Malaysia. Almost no violence exists at all. <clears throat> we are not inherently either or. We can be either or depending on what we learn, depending on the values taught to us, the culture that we're brought up in. This leads to the question, is human behavior just learned um, or is it instinctual? Is there any instinctual aspect to that? It's kind of the age old question, right? Are we products of nurture, our upbringing or nature, our genetics, our biology? Um, is our behavior learned or is it inherited? Is it set in stone when we're born? Um, are we product of the environment we're brought up in or is it again, genetic sort of written in our DNA? <clears throat> Some behavior is definitively shaped by underlying biological instincts. Um, so the example I have for you, which I'll come back to in just a moment, is this taste, this craving, this desire for fatty, sweet, or salty foods. Why it's hard once you open the thing of cookies or the chips, why it's hard to sort of put that back down. That is not your fault. Okay. That's written into our genetics. And I'll come back to that in just a moment. And this idea of the interplay between biology and culture, how does how does our underlying biology sort of shape? our behavior and how is it adaptive? How has it helped us survive? How is being bipedal adaptive? Um, how is this adaptive? How are our large brains adaptive? How have they enhanced our survival and reproduction? This falls under the purview of evolutionary anthropology. So there, these folks are interested in how are our behaviors actually adaptive? 
um, conferred a survival advantage in the past, at least. Evolutionary psychology similarly related, but looking at um, things like emotions, the, the parts of the brain, um, anxiety, and how are these things actually also adaptive, at least when they evolved. <clears throat> anxiety, for example, that's highly adaptive. That's your body coursing chemicals through, through you to, to spur you into action. Um, it's become somewhat maladaptive these days because we get it every time we have to check our email or something like that. Um, but initially in its evolution, that's adaptive. It, it drives us into action. So back to our diagram. <clears throat> if evolutionary anthropology is interested in all human behavior from an evolutionary perspective, uh, what box could we stick evolutionary anthropology in here on our diagram? Five, exactly. Um, looking at, again, all, all humans, all human, all individuals and these biological influences. So essentially whenever we see a biological influence on culture or human behavior, it's usually at the species level, right? Because it's, it's something inherent to our biology as a species. So you'd see it across everyone in that group. There are some cases in which um, there's biological influences at the level of the group. And the example I'm thinking of has to do with um, lactose intolerance or what we call lactase persistence. And so <clears throat> some of us have the ability to digest dairy products and some of us lack that enzyme. The, the enzyme that breaks down dairy is called lactase. It breaks down lactose. In dairy products, um, that's the main carbohydrate is lactose. It's a disaccharide. It has to be broken down before it can be digested. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks lactose down so you can then digest it. All mammals produce lactase because we drink our mother's milk, right? We breastfeed. But animals, mammals don't produce lactase beyond infancy, beyond weaning, because no one's drinking milk past that point. Um, so it'd be a waste of your body's energy to, to continue to produce that enzyme for a food that you're never going to eat. You're never going to need the enzyme again after weaning. <clears throat> However, in some human populations, lactase persistence, the ability to continue to produce lactase, the enzyme past weaning was selected for because it conferred an advantage. And it's specifically sort of European farming communities and also what we call pastoral groups, which are basically people that live on herd animals. You might've heard of the Maasai or the New Wear. These are pastoral groups. Um, they live off herd animals, cattle, llama, whatever it might be. They subsist off dairy products. And so in these environments where the possibility for exploiting dairy as a resource was there, um, this enzyme became selected for over time in certain individuals giving them an advantage because they are able to access this resource that other people can't really use. They can't digest it. Over time, you see that enzyme represented in higher and higher numbers in the population. And so that's why sort of around the world, you have some people that produce lactase, um, some don't. It has to do with our evolutionary history and the type of resources people used to have in their environments. So it's a good example of where we sort of see a biological influence at the group level right? Because your biological ability to produce lactase is going to affect your behavior. What resources, namely in this case, you can now digest dairy products. <laughs> you said there's, so there's a few of these examples. For the most part, when we see a biological influence on culture or humans, um, a lot of times that's sort of a universal influence. <clears throat> so back to the example of, of this. <clears throat> From an evolutionary perspective, why do we like these foods? Why do we crave them? And maybe burgers or cake aren't your thing, but you know, salty, fatty, sort of sugary. Our bodies actually have evolved to crave these things. So <clears throat> throughout our history, these foods were scarce. There's no cheeseburger tree in the Kalahari. It became therefore adaptive to carry genes that caused us to crave these foods. Types of foods with high fat, high salt, um, 
sugar. These are energy dense foods. There's a lot of calories packed into a pretty small punch. And so it's adaptive to take advantage of them in your environment when they exist. Sort of a stock up and get it mentality, right? While you can. Um, and so genes that cause us to crave these things have been selected for. That's actually written into our DNA. But our environment has changed. Our genetic predisposition to craving these foods hasn't changed. The foods used to be scarce in our environment. Now the environment is different and these foods are largely abundant, especially in sort of developed countries. Um, we have easy access to high fat, high salt, high sugar foods. In, in the U.S., a lot of times that's the accessible food for people lower on the socioeconomic ladder. Um, watch Food Inc. if you want to know why that is. And one of the results is obesity rates, right? About a third plus of all Americans are considered obese. Um, because again, our genes haven't really changed. The environment in which we now live has changed greatly and these foods are readily available. It's what we call evolutionary mismatch. Our genes haven't changed much. Evolution moves at a glacial pace. The environment in which we're interacting and our genes are being triggered has changed a lot. <clears throat> Despite uh, some of these evolutionary influences that I've mentioned, most social scientists agree that biologically we're really not much different from our ancestors 50,000, 150,000 years ago. Um, we're just not, not much has changed in terms of our biology. <clears throat> and so the process through which we learn our culture, much of our behavior, our ideology is known as enculturation. Right. This is the process of social learning, um, the tra transmission of cultural knowledge down to the next generation. In other words, we are essentially tabula rasa, right? meaning blank slates when we're born. Um, much of how you end up has to do with the group that you're brought up in, the culture that you're brought up in. And the evidence for that, think of adopted children. right? <clears throat> if you adopt a child from... I don't know, the Kalahari or uh, Indonesia or Japan, uh, that child might resemble the biological population where they come from, but they're not going to develop into having Japanese culture or Kung culture or whatever, unless that's the culture they're brought up in, right? They're going to develop um, how, where they're brought up. So if they're brought up in the U.S., right, they're going to be enculturated into that, um, regardless of sort of biologically where they came from. 